Welcome to Catch Outdoors, presented by the Waypoint Podcast Network at waypointtv.com. I'm your host, Scott Rob Bodie, reporting to listeners each and every week from the fabulous Florida Keys. Podcast is centered around the great outdoors, especially down here in the most southern regions of the continental U.S. So kick back for the next 40 minutes or so and get a taste of my Florida. This week's episode is number 83. Fly fishing is more than an addiction. <laughs> well, it can be, yes. <laughs> but first, some local news and fishing reports. Yes, no plural on the fishing reports. This past week, a very good friend of ours visited down from Inglewood. Uh, Angie brought her friend Paul along for the ride, and we all had a great time on land and on the water, for that matter. Uh, Thursday evening, we attended the 10th Annual Bonefish Tarpon Trust Florida Keys Dinner and Circle of Honor Inductions. Um, did this last year. There were about 100 and some odd people outside tent. Uh, a lot of construction work was going on at the, uh, at the Chica Lodge. This year, it was held in the ballroom. Uh, it was really, really good. And lots and lots and lots of people showed up. So, uh, those being honored were the late Captain Billy Knowles. <clears throat> He's kind of a, I call him a historic figure here in the Florida Keys. He's one of the best fishing guides that has ever been around. Uh, also, Dr. Lloyd Rubel was here. Uh, Dr. Lloyd Rubel, uh, he's known for his fishing prowess in the, um, up in the lower 10,000 islands, things like the Lost River, all that kind of, that area basically. Um, he had associations with some incredible fishing folks from that area as well and really learned uh, fishing. But he's also just been a, a starch supporter of all things environmental when it comes to fishing. And last but certainly not least, Flip Pallet. Uh, that was great. Good to see a lot of old fishing friends again. I mean, seeing Flip, being able to talk to Flip again, um, th- you know. Have you ever seen the show uh, Walker's K Chronicles? If you haven't, you should. Um, th- that was, I mean, that was really what got me going. You know, watching that show. First of all, Flip is very eloquent when he talks, and he speaks of what it's really like to be in the back bays in the water, what you see and how it feels. It's not all about oh, I got a big one, that kind of stuff. That's not the kind of fishing show it is, although it happens. <laughs> but it's a, a lot of fly and spin fishing in the small, little shallow waters of of the southern reaches of Florida. Uh, you know, Cape Sable over to where we live, actually. And I don't know, just the way that he views what's out there it was incredible. If you haven't ever seen the Walker's K Chronicles, you really need to uh, grab YouTube and do a search for Walker's K Chronicles and Flip Pallet. And it'll pop, there's a whole bunch of episodes on there. And, and take a listen, take a watch. Um, it's really quite good. But anyway, this it was great. There were a lot of old friends and people that I haven't seen since last year at the event, and it was kind of fun to touch base again with everybody. And this time around, um, there were like over 300 people there at this one. The one before, like I said, was probably slightly over 100. So it was really, really great. And this is a huge moneymaker for the Bone Fish Tarpon Trust. I mean, they do a great job doing research on tarpon and bonefish migration, but also on all the other water-related things down here in the Keys that are very important to us to keep the fisheries up to snuff, especially the <clears throat> the movement of water through uh, the central part of the state down into the Florida Bay, through the Everglades into the Florida Bay, instead of going out to the two rivers on the eastern, you know, Caloosahatchee and, and over towards Stewart. They're just trying to fix that. And big things are being done, finally. <laughs> big things are being done. The next day, I took Angie and Paul fishing uh, in the backcountry up in Florida Bay. What a day. That was Friday. Nice snook. Found the snook. Yay. Found a big snook. And Paul caught two. So that was really good. Uh, sea trout, bunch of ladyfish. Nice sea trout. Paul also, also landed a 20-inch sea trout. So that's the biggest one I've seen back there in the bay yet. Most of the, the sea trout have been barely legal, if not under. But uh, it was nice to see a few big ones, and especially that one. Um weather was perfect um just flat (laughs) just like it's supposed to be back there um let's see artificials we used artificials rapala twitch and mullet 
uh, with a pilchard pattern. So basically, it just looked like a small pilchard. Now, I use the size number six. I've had the best luck with the six versus the eights. Eights are a little bit too big for back there. Might work better on shores or maybe off Cape Sable or down on the ocean side, but the sixes work great in the backcountry. Um, also use the Gulp Swimming Mullet. Uh, in bone white that was pinned on a z-man quarter inch quarter inch quarter weight quarter pound quarter ounce <laughs> get it out of here in a minute quarter ounce jig head with green eyes uh, the eyes are really interesting the z-man lures I, I like them a lot i've mentioned this before they are just plain lead gray um, they don't color the head itself it's the eyes and the eyes are big um, and come in quite a few different colors. The ones I usually key on are green, red, this kind of, op uh, I don't know, opal-looking white. If you know what opal is, it's kind of a white with a sheen to it. Um, yellow, I like the yellow ones as well. So those are the ones that kind of go with. We were using all green that day, and it was working great, so there was no point in switching. But if I have trouble, I'll usually switch out the, um, the jig uh, for a different color eye. Um, but the eye is principal in the Z-Man. So when you check it out, check out the uh, the different eye colors. Uh, Sunday back out again with Janelle. Also in the back country. Got on the trout again. Ladies. And this time a bunch of jacks. But no snook. Um, guess they retired from the day before as of being harassed. <laughs> and we did a little exploring too. Which that's what I'm trying to do more of. You know, when you find a fishing spot, what do you do? Yeah, you gravitate back to the fishing spot. So it's a much better idea if you can spend a little bit more time uh, looking for new spots. And, you know, that's what I've been doing since we moved here in August. And so it's nice now to really be able to jump on a spot, get a few fish, and then break away and go, go hunt for different locations. And that's what we did. We found some that were really worth exploring in the future. Beautiful flats way up in the back. Um, you know, barely float a boat in these areas, but boy, it was nice. Uh, also saw some really amazing, some pods of uh, manatees came through. And in the clear water, that's it's pretty amazing. But large pod, I think there was a pod of four or five around us at one time. So, But I love getting back there because it's beautiful. And I love looking around back in, the, uh, in what I call my backyard. Uh, we use the same lures as the previous trip, uh, the Arties. I like to use Arties whenever possible. I spent 20 years running fishing charters with live bait, gathered by throwing a net, and also live shrimp. And I'm really trying to avoid doing that again if at all, if at all possible. It's so much easier to take artificials. a lot easier to clean the boat up, too, after it's over with. Um, the fishing has also really been on. I'll give you a, just an over, uh, overall general fishing report from the area. The fishing has been on this past week thanks to great weather. We really had a great, just a, a nice lay down of the winds, uh, no rain, um, really sunny, nice, just beautiful days. You know, blue skies and white puffy clouds, that kind of thing with very little wind. Maybe a breeze in the afternoon of five, maybe 10 at the most. Um, the mahi bite's been really good along the weed lines. Um, they're trolling rig ballyhoo out there. That seems to have been the ticket, you know, with skirts on them. Uh, same presentation is also attracting wahoo. I've seen some really big. George Poveroma posted one the other day on his site. It was a monster uh, caught trolling, so really beautiful fish. Uh, and also the best fish, tasting fish in the ocean, I think. Uh, that's just my opinion, but God, I love it. Um, Lots of dolphin are being caught along the weed lines. Uh, so, you know, the, the dreaded blob that was supposed to be around here, well, it's it's not the dreaded blob right now. It's coming up on beaches. I'm not gonna, There are some areas that are getting it washed up, but that's very, very typical this time of year. The patch reefs, the usual yellowtail, mutton snapper, grunts and porgies for more action, uh, and a healthy dose of Spanish mackerel now. I've noticed some uh, some posts and some fishing reports from the Middle Keys up to here. I didn't see much below that down into Key West, but the Middle Keys up to here on uh, Spanish max. So live shrimps working on the reefs and any castable or towable lure. <laughs> yep, right. You know, trolling. Yes, yeah, trolling lure is getting the job done uh, with the max. I mentioned last week that I finally got to work on my YouTube channel. I uh, put up a new video. Uh, so go to YouTube and tune in to Catch You Outdoors. That's Catch You Outdoors. Please subscribe for free. And that way you'll get notifications when I add another video. 
Um, new video is drone shots over Florida being Atlantic Ocean. Thank you all for the feedback. That was really appreciated. I, it, I like showing off the beauty of where I live, and I certainly like showing off the beauty of the water that's around us. It's, it's incredible, especially from on high looking down. Um, been pretty. It's a good thing to watch on a rainy or a cold day. All right, let's get into it. Episode 83, Fly Fishing is More Than an Addiction. Way back, almost a year ago, I did a podcast called The Zen of Fly Fishing. It was mostly about the aura of fly fishing and, and why anglers gravitate to it when they're looking to expand their, their fishing horizons. Uh, you know, maybe something about a little boredom is setting in, or you've been fishing, fishing, and for some reason you stop and you don't know why, and it's like, gosh, I, I don't know. I need something to build up the excitement level. That's That seems to be, at least in my opinion, that's that's part of what fly fishing is all about for a lot of people. Um, this time the podcast will be a little more technical, or a lot more technical, <laughs> with suggestions for how to get into the sport of fly fishing what equipment's needed, things like that. So if you want to hear more about the craziness of fly fishing, the way it feels and why you do it, you can go back to the episode. It was called The Zen of Fly Fishing. I think it's around the 40s, like 45, 46, 47, somewhere in there. Um, anyway, so here we go. Fly fishing um, isn't really an addiction. For those that have found it, it becomes more of an obsession and... I'm obsessed, <laughs> and many others are too. However, I don't give up spin. The last many trips, last eight, nine, ten trips I've taken have been spin. I haven't taken the fly rod with me. That's going to change this week, but um, I, pretty much I was locating fish by doing fan cast and working allure as quickly as possible just to get hits and see where things are. When, when I'm exploring a new area, area, it's probably not going to be fly fishing. And there's not. A, I'm not going to say that that fly fishing is bad to do that with. You can, uh, but quite honestly, I I do better with spin when it comes to that. The fly fishing for me is more of a relaxing sport. Um, but I will say this: it it tends to get the fish, the big fish you're looking for, better than spin does. And I'll get into that in just a second. So um, I've done entire months without a fly rod, just so you know. And then all of a sudden it occurs to me that the species that I'm going after are much more likely to take a fly over a spin type artificial. It's really that simple. Um, I may be tossing those twitch and mullets or something and then realize, you know, if I just got a little clouser out that looked like this, that was smaller in profile, more like the bait, and was gentler at hitting the water, unlike almost any artificial you throw on spin, that I'm probably not going to spook the fish away as the lure hits the water, that they're more apt to react by simply striking it. And that just happens in fly. And I was out you know, with Janelle on Sunday yesterday, and it occurred to me, I'm like, you know, I really got to start packing that fly rod. Now I'm starting to find these fish in certain locations. I'm starting to pattern the fish. And now it's time to add the fly to the system to, to really to really start getting on these. Um, for me, fly fishing uh, began with my grandfather. Well, sort of. I knew he was obsessed with it. Uh, he, he didn't really sit me down with a lesson or anything, but I just knew that he really enjoyed it and that he traveled far and wide to do it. I also inherited a lot of his fly gear when he passed away, and I felt it was only right to use it. Um, I don't believe in storing stuff away and admiring it. <laughs> it doesn't work that way in my world. But his gear was almost all fresh water. So I set it aside and went about my usual way with spin stuff in the salt. Um, the turning point uh, was about the late 70s, is after I got out of the Coast Guard, I was shopping for a new fishing hat, and I stopped by the Orvis shop, a very new Orvis shop located in the mall, and it, by the way, it was, at that time was called The Mall <laughs> in Louisville, Kentucky. And um, that was my stomping grounds after my stint in the USCG was, was Louisville. Mike, his real name, <laughs> saw me looking at the fly rods, and we talked, and he rigged one up, and then took me out behind the mall and had me cast it with his instructions, and... That's all she wrote. Um, it, I was in totally intrigued and and taken with the with the whole with, with just the whole thing. I was just like, this is really wild. So it began a new wave for me and a new way 
um, to catch fish, which, which really helped me get back solidly back into fishing again. I used my new fly rod to go after smallmouth bass in the creeks of Kentucky and Ohio, and also used some of my grandfather's equipment there as well. Um, I still have that first rod, that first fly rod, but alas, I'm now a salty fisherman, and I really can't use it here at all. But it'll never leave the collection, and we'll hopefully wind up with a family member when I'm gone, and we'll inspire them to jump headlong into the sport of fly fishing. I, I hope so. Okay, here comes the technical stuff. This will take a while, so brace yourselves, relax, get a drink. Here comes the technical stuff. Yes, indeed. You'll probably have questions after this, so don't hesitate to send me an email at catchyoutdoors at gmail.com. Keep it basic at first. If everything goes as planned, you'll graduate soon enough into fancier, better, and more expensive goodies. It happens. It happens in every sport. I, I used to use... When I was talking fly fishing talks, you know, when I was doing seminars and stuff, I always use an analogy with cameras. Everybody started, you know, in my day, hey, you start with a little brownie instamatic, you know. But there, okay, there's somebody out there going, what? Yeah, okay, just imagine your first digital camera. If you're if you're younger, you, know, you got that little Panasonic camera. It, it Its pixelation wasn't all that great. The memory card held about 25 pictures, and then you had to dump it. Okay, you get the idea. And as you get better at photography or you enjoy it, what do you do? Well, you jump into 35 millimeter and then you jump into special lenses that attach to the 35 millimeter. And then you start experimenting in black and white photography along with color photography and low light. And, and it goes on and on. And the next thing you know, you know, you got that Hasselblad, which is an enormously expensive camera. Now, that's how it goes. And that's how fly fishing is. Fly fishing, you start out uh, cheaper. I'll use that word. Start cheap. It doesn't mean the quality is bad. Just get the price down. And the reason I say that is some people, and I haven't met too many, but some people don't really just don't get into it. They go, they try it and they go, nah, I don't know, this is just not for me. And that's okay. I mean, I get it because um, it's a learning curve, but I understand. But if that's you, then you don't want to pile a bunch of money into it and then walk away from it. That just makes absolutely no sense. So. Um, so, you know, rods, let's go there. Temple Fork. I'm going to say that name right off the bat. Better known as TFO with the fly folks. That's Temple Fork Outfitters is what that stands for. But Temple Fork has been around for quite a while now. It's good stuff. Well-made. Very good for starters. Heck, I still have one. Uh, the cost to start is about 150 to 200 bucks for the rod. Uh, that'll get you a, a nine foot eight weight. We'll talk about that in just a second. You can also get combos uh, for around 250. So in other words, you can get a temple fork rod and reel combo. And there's nothing wrong with that. It work, they work fine. I don't, honestly, I'm not sure who manufactured temple fork reels if they actually do it themselves. I know the rods are there. So it's, it might be a third party that they're buying to make the combo with, but, but they work great. So don't be afraid of it. Um, in the world of salt, though, as I mentioned, you're going to be looking for a nine foot rod, eight weight. That's going to be that's going to be the basics. Seven's a little too small, but used by some folks just for the fun of it. You know, getting a bigger fish on a small, lighter weight rod. Uh, but for all around saltwater fishing, this is going to be for backcountry, near shore, even working a patch reef or working the beaches. Um, an eight weight will work fine. Nine foot is a pretty much standard length for fly rods. That's that's pretty much the, the length. Sounds huge, doesn't it? There's a reason for that. That's part of the cast, but casting. But anyway, uh, so there you go. Nine foot, eight weight. All right. Now, what does all that mean? Well, obviously, the length is self-explanatory. The weight's the thing that throws people off. Fly rods and lines are sold by weight. And what that means is the higher the number, the heavier they are, the stronger they are, the fatter the line is, the more stout the rod is. And they are matched. So you can't monkey around with this. You can't get like an eight weight rod and then throw a six weight line on. It won't cast it correctly. The, the rod is literally built for that weight line so that everything balances. 
what you must know in fly fishing is the line itself does all the work. Okay, the rod helps, of course, but the line is you're throwing the line out. You're not you're not casting a lure on a spin spin rod that pulls the line off the reel. Okay, so basically you have very light line on your fishing reel for spin. You have a lure tied to the end. You cast it. The lure pulls the line off of the reel, right? That's not how fly fishing works. The fly fishing, the line is already on the deck of the boat or the dock or the beach at your feet. So you've pulled it off the reel. Now the rod, using a motion called 10 o'clock and 2 o'clock, you can alter that later, uh, above your head, basically like a metronome, um, takes the line and slowly casts it out as you let it through your fingers off of the deck, the dock, or the beach. Now, explaining this on a podcast is really hard. I would expect somebody to go look at YouTube and say, okay, how in the world do you cast a fly, fly line? And you'll see it. So it's important that this is matched. It's real important. So you get an eight-weight rod. You're looking for eight-weight fishing line. It's, it's really about that simple. Let's talk about the reel, and then we'll get back to the line line weights and types. Kind of complicated, but let's do the reel first. Really simple to start with, but at the same time, it can be later moved to an upgraded rod. So where you might save the money on a rod, and you decide later on that you really do love this sport, you might want to spend a little more in a reel, but <clears throat> if you're not real sure how this is going to go, then you can get a really decent reel for $59.99. All the way up to $99. You really can. There's lots of decent reels out there that are saltwater rated. Um, I'm a big fan of a reels called, made by Scientific Angler. They're one of the, they're, they've been around forever. And they're one of the ones that are, are down in that $100 to $150 range that are extremely well crafted, well made, and will last you if you decide to upgrade. But you don't have to do that. I just wanted to kind of throw that name out there because I had a lot of good luck with that particular manufacturer and they've gone all out in the last couple of years to really redesign their reels as far as the uh, appearance and the physical part of it and they're great they're really really good reels so there you go so we'll start out with a rod <clears throat> that's around 150 a reel that's 100 um, and then your fly line and the fly lines run 50 bucks to about 69 dollars so that and that that's yeah, that's about average. They, they can be more, but that's about average. By the way, I was looking through one of the catalogs I get in the mail. I got one from Orvis, and they've got it. They've actually got a reel in there now at a starter price, around a hundred bucks. I think it was, I think it was one thirty, one twenty nine, something like that. So I was kind of surprised to see that. Plus, it's salt water, so that was really cool. So be sure to check check that out. It's another brand that I know is good. Um, keep in mind that the reel in fly fishing is not like a reel for spin fishing. Okay, this is a, a totally different animal. It doesn't work nearly half as hard. Uh, you don't cast with the reel, as I mentioned earlier. You're literally throwing the line with the rod. The reel just keeps line. That's really all it does until you get a big fish on. Then the reel comes into play. As the fish takes off and pulls the fly line that you may still have around your feet, you got to be careful when that happens, and, it, and the line gets what's known as on the reel, which means all of a sudden the line comes tight and now you're on the reel, then the drag comes into play and reeling in the line comes into play. So you have to understand that those things aren't happening all the time. And especially if you're on a batch of sea trout, ladyfish, maybe even small redfish or small snook, you're, you're probably not going to get the line on the reel. You're, you're going to be working the line with your hands and on the rod itself. So that's, that's why I tell people, easy on that reel at first later on the the obsession slash addiction will catch and then you can <laughs> there are some really beautiful reels out there in that 500 to 600 dollar range even more so all right now the fly line the lines match the weight of the rod as i mentioned before and the reel you're using so for example if you get an eight weight rod which is what i'm recommending the reels will be a seven eight reel which means the reel works on both seven weight line and eight weight they almost always have a matching number so it'll be like a four five five six six seven seven eight eight nine that kind of thing <clears throat> as far as the the um, uh, weight of the line is considered so um, in this case you're going to be doing a probably a seven eight is what i would recommend Sorry about the sputtering and coughing every now and then. My allergies are kicking in. Oh, it's lovely springtime in Florida. <laughs> anyway, um, the 
Lines, again, they come in three configurations. So let's start with that. You've got the weight part I've mentioned. So you got a reel that matches the weight, the rod matches, and now the line does too. So you're going to be wanting, you're going to be buying an eight weight line. Um, the lines come in three different configurations. There's a floating line, an intermediate line, and a sinking line. And there's more unders. We'll get into that in a second. That's the basic three. A floating line does exactly what it says. The line floats on the surface. Simple. Intermediate sinks really, really slow. <laughs> or some of it sinks and the rest of it doesn't. It can be, you know, sinking tip, stuff like that. And then there's a sinking line. And the sinking line, when it hits the water, it starts to slowly sink down. Now, these are all used in different configurations, obviously. For example, if you're fishing the beach uh, and you're fishing in a foot or two of water or even maybe three feet, floating's fine. In the backcountry where you're fishing in a foot or one foot, of, two, two feet of water, rather, floating is fine. So, you know, you're okay with that. Um, and that's also because when you add the leader and the tippet, which I'll talk about in a minute, that will also sink because it's generally kind of a monofilament configuration or, or a fluorocarbon configuration. And of course, there's a fly on the end that helps weight it ever so slightly. So there are times when you just don't need to even worry about an intermediate or sinking. There are times when you do. The prime example would be if you're a beach fisherman and it's been rough out there. And the water's churned up, and the water's cloudy, uh, and you're trying to fish it with a fly. You fish in that sense, go to the bottom. So I know snook do for a fact. Snook do not, they, they'll feed up in the water uh, column when the water's clear. Uh, and they also are look up fish. In other words, when they're near bottom, they're looking up to see what's over their head. And that works great for floating line fly fishing. But when it's murky, the snook work the bottom. I mean, they work right on the bottom. And you got to get a fly down there to them. And that's where the intermediate and sinking lines come into play. So there you go. Now, the subtleness I was talking about, these, these little underlying things with the, with the fly line itself. You can have um, weight forward. You can have sinking tip. And there's also one called DT, which stands for double taper. Now, double taper is something that fly fishermen use up north on small streams with dry flies. You ain't going to be worried about that too much in, ever <laughs> in saltwater fishing. So don't worry about the double taper right now. Um, what, you, what you really want to consider is whether it's, whether it's a, a, an intermediate style weight forward or a sinking tip. So what weight forward means is the fly line itself is designed with heavier weight at the tip than in the middle or the back of the line. And the fly line is typically about 100 feet long. Okay, just that's your that's your working line. It's about 100 feet long. So weight forward helps you cast it. And I would highly recommend that, especially if you're starting out, you want a weight forward line, no doubt about it. The sinking tip is up to you. Um, Again, back to what type of fishing you're going to do, whether it's going to sink down after you cast in the water or whether you don't care if it just floats. Okay, so, I mean, really pretty simple. So, weight forward, we're thinking you definitely want to deal with a weight forward line. That, that helps with loading the cast and makes the cast much easier. Now, I mentioned the fact that you've got 100 feet of line. That ain't all you got. That's just the fly line. Underneath the fly line, on, at the base of the reel, is a thing called the backing line. Uh, just also known as backing is what most of us refer to it as. That's usually a Daycron line, very similar to like braid, a uh, 20 pound test, a 30 pound test just depends on, you know, how much, how much packing you want to do underneath the fly line uh, to help the whole thing come together. It's, it's kind of hard to explain again without pictures. That's the interesting thing about a podcast, but backing goes on the reel first picture braided line, whatever color whatever you like you can match your reel you can be you go op art i mean i've seen people do double backings where they change colors whatever um bright orange i kind of like orange myself you know once the fly line goes out i can keep track of the orange line i know where it is and i can see it and everyone who's known me for years knows i love yum yum yellow i like bright yellow line that works too but orange is kind of cool anyway that's what the backing does and you're going to need quite a bit of it uh each reel has a specification on how many yards you're going to need to put on there a lot of them are at least Oh, gosh, I'd say probably 300 feet easy on there, um, some more, some less. And then and your fly line is tied to that and goes on top of the backing. OK, so backing is something you're definitely going to have to add to the reel. Then you have the leader. The leader line is pretty similar to a leader that you would tie on in spin fishing, but different. The leader is actually tapered. So the leader is typically larger in the back where it's tied to the fly line than it is on the tip where it's tied to the fly itself 
or onto a thing called a tippet. I'll get there in just a second. So your leader line will be, I like to use seven foot of it, and they come pre, pre-manufactured, by the way, in, in uh, tapered. So you can get a seven foot leader, a nine foot is another one. I like nine foot when the fish are skittish. Um, fishing for bonefish, I would highly recommend a nine foot, but when you're fishing for snook reds and trout, you can easily go with a seven foot um, uh, tapered leader. They are sold in pound weight, just like fishing lines. So you have an 8-pound, 10-pound, 20-pound, 15-pound, whatever it might be, um, leader. Again, that goes with what you're fishing for. I like to keep it in the 10 to 12-pound range because I'm going to tie a tippet on the end. And what's a tippet? A tippet is like adding a fluorocarbon leader on spin fishing. Okay, in spin fishing, you got your fishing line, right? On the end of it, you put a leader line. That's usually fluorocarbon. It's a few feet long. That's at the smallest, a few feet long. And it'll be heavier than whatever the fishing line is you're using. The leader will be 20 pound or 30 pound, depending on what you're going after. That's that's the I'm just speaking in averages here, but that's typically what people use in saltwater fishing. Fly fishing is the same way, but there's another step. The the leader line is tapered, and then a tippet is tied. That's your leader leader <laughs> is tied to the end of that, and that would be like your 20 pound piece of fluorocarbon. And in this case, it's much smaller. You only need about oh I don't know 18 inches of it, and you tie the fly to that. Uh, what that is, is a bite tippet is what it's most often known as. In other words, so things don't bite you off. If you try to take the eight, nine, 10 pound tapered leader, put a lure on the end of it, and along comes Mr. Snook or something with teeth, it will probably saw through it and break you off. So that's what the tippet's for. So it's just an extra piece in there. I know it sounds confusing, but that's how it works. Why is the leader tapered? I get asked that a lot. Fly lines, when cast, are basically creating an airfoil. And in order for that fly line to unfold properly in in front of you when you stop casting, when you start to lay the cast down or drop the rod tip down, the line unfolds onto the water. If you don't have a tapered leader, the leader will bog down the cast at the very end and cause everything to just drop into the water in a heap. So in other words, it's important that you have that tapered leader so that the whole line will fall out in front of you or spill nicely. It's so hard to describe, but it just, you know, it will fail if you don't use a tapered leader there. That that pretty much sums it up. Okay, you still with me? <laughs> Good. <laughs> Finally, you'll need a few, a few, yeah, a few flies <laughs> to start out with. Um, This is the fun part, actually. No, no, really it is. But it's best to ask the fly shop guys and gals what they recommend uh, for fishing in your specific location. I mean, flies, if you think spin stuff comes in a zing uh, configuration, you have no idea how crazy it can get in fly fishing because everybody has a better idea. Flies are made from, originally, from fur and feathers, primarily. That's pretty much what they were put together with. So feathers from birds, some chickens to whatever, uh, down to fur from every animal imaginable. Even some of the guys who are willing to snip a tiny bit of fur off their dog or their cat. I don't recommend that, (laughs) but I know people have done it. Um, And there are some hairs out there that are expensive and very popular like polar bear hair which is illegal most of the time in the united states i'm not sure how you get it now but i know you can i think you can i I shouldn't say i know you can there's also all kinds of feathers that you cannot use for obvious reasons what i like to do is gather feathers at the beach you'd be surprised what you find at the beach that'll work for fly tying so basically you've got this little bitty thing it's it's a hook um and the hooks are fairly standard. You know, they're like they're like small one aughts and two odd hooks. Some of them are long shanked, so it's easier to tie the material to them. But essentially, you're creating something that looks like a fish. Now, remember this: in saltwater fishing, in most saltwater environments, you are trying to imitate bait, not a bug. Okay, this is a little different than fly fishing in lakes. Fly fishing in lakes, they use. They use flies called terrestrials. That sounds like it is. It's spiders, ants, crickets, grasshoppers, things like that, as well as things that swim in the water. So it's a combo. In saltwater fishing, you don't really need to worry too much about those. Okay, Most of the things that you're going to fish with are recreating some sort of a bait fish of some kind. 
Now that's where the designs get kind of wild and wiggly because everybody just goes, oh, I can do that. I'll add this and I'll put a little wing on that. And I'll do a little pizzazz on this and I'm just going to make the greatest fly ever. And of course it fails. Well, not of course, but it sometimes fails or most times fails. I've been there. But then every now and then you get this genius idea and it really, really works. A good friend of mine, down here in the Keys, Tim Borsky. Tim Borsky is an artist. He's also, uh, before I knew him as an artist, I knew him as one of the best fly tires in the business. And he came up with a very simple idea that's now found everywhere. Simply taking a black magic marker, in this case it was probably an artist pen since he's an artist, and putting black stripes on a fly. I mean, he would lay the fly down flat. This is how I do it. I don't know how he does it, but I would lay it down on a piece of paper and make little black lines on the fly that look like bars on the side of a little pinfish and man oh man that dang on fly caught everything and it was such a simple thing it wasn't even adding any fur or any feathers it was simply drawing on the fly and so that's where all these creative ideas come from i've seen sponge faces i've seen poppers made that way i've seen eyeballs attached by using sequins off of ladies dresses i've seen all kinds of stuff out there and guess what they work. They really do. So that's where the fun comes in is selecting the fly. Try to get the person behind the counter to help you as much as possible. However, however, I got to give you my opinion. You really can't go wrong with two flies that have been out there for, oh my gosh, one of them for probably 50 years. I'm not sure about the other. The Clouser Minnow and Lefty's Deceiver. Okay, so the Clouser Minnow is a very simple fly made mostly of deer hair. Matter of fact, I think it's in most cases all deer hair unless you're adding a little flash or something to it. And a couple of little barbell eyes. It's, it's a little lead. It just picture a lead barbell, a hand barbell that you would use for exercise, and only it's tiny. Um, very lightweight. So those are the eyeballs, and then you add the fur to it. But they're called the Clouser Minnow. Uh, the effective color for me personally is chartreuse over white, also brown over white, light brown over white works really well. So kind of a color combination, but the clouser is just, you can catch anything on a clouser. You really can. That should be one of the first flies that you try. The second one, the lefty's deceiver is basically looks like a bait fish. It's more feather than fur. Uh, it has a little fur, but it's mo ones I tie have fur, but, but the feather is on the outside like wings, like folded, wings folded on the side of a bird. And it creates a bait fish, creates a really nice little bait fish. And of course, in whatever color you happen to pick the feathers out in, and by the way, they dye the feathers so you can get feathers of any color now. Um, so that's the two. Uh, Clouser Minnow and Lefty's Deceiver. Those are the two I'd recommend right off the bat. Now, as I said, there are zillions of others. And they're typically sold at at, uh, at the fly shops and, and other places. And then there's fly tying. Oh, no. <laughs> yes, you too can make them. Um, this becomes a whole nother hobby on top of the fly fishing hobby. And I think that's what's so unique about the sport. When you get down to the fact that you've got the cast down and you're catching some fish and you're using those store-bought flies that you're very happy with, take a look at the fly and figure out how to make them yourself. The fly fishing uh, stores that I associate with and have in the past almost always have fly tying sessions at their stores. Obviously, it's to bring you into the store, introduce you to the things that they also have for sale on the shelves, but it's a great learning tool because you'll have people around you who are either a little better than you are, a little worse than you are. And everybody has a tidbit. They always have, well, I do this and you go, oh, wow, I never thought of that. Um, so I love, I love fly tying sessions. They're really great. Fly tying is also a great hobby to have when it is too windy and too nasty to go fishing. You can sit down at the vise. That's what the thing's called that holds the hook. Sit down at the vise and just start tying your own flies and creating this thing that you've had in the back of your mind for months and you just hadn't got around to. And guess what? Drop it in front of a fish and it gets taken. It's probably one of the most satisfying things in fishing. To have a fish take something that you actually created out of a bunch of little materials and the fish actually ate it. And then you're like, ooh, I'm on to something. And that's, that, that's a lot of fun. This is important. The important part. <laughs> no, it's all important, but this is real important. You may be talented enough to teach yourself how to cast with a fly rod, but I'd highly advise taking a few live in-person sessions. Okay? Some lessons by in-sessions. This will prevent you from developing really bad habits from the start. 
It may so that may hinder your enjoyment later on and things that you might have to fix, which is okay. Let's go with the analogy of golf. <laughs> I taught myself how to golf. I taught myself a swing and I taught myself putting and all that. You know, I just did. And here's the deal. Uh, I took a few lessons and it straightened a lot of stuff out. But man, it was a hard road to hoe. It, it was, you know, it was tough. Um, it just, it's, it's, you know, teaching the old dog new tricks kind of syndrome. So it's best if you take a few fly casting lessons. It really is. It'll get you off on the right foot. It'll make life so much simpler. And again, just like the fly shops have got fly tying sessions, they've also got good contact with people that will teach you how to how to fly cast. And that's it's just, I mean, it's important. Yes, it's on YouTube. Yes, you can get all kinds of tips from books and drawings and things like that. But there's really nothing like having a one-on-one session with someone who really knows how to cast uh, a fly rod and a fly and get them to show you the rudiments to set you in, off into the right direction before you make the terrible little mistakes that will inevitably happen if you try to teach yourself. I'm going to say this again. By the way, thanks for hanging in there through all that. I really appreciate it. I'm going to say this again because it's really important to me. Summer is coming. It's time to take a kid fishing. It's very important. Most anglers, when asked how they got started into the world of fishing, it was by a family member. Most likely dad, but nowadays it could be mom or any other family member. So, you know, get out there with the kids and get them started on this sport. Summer means outdoors for everywhere in the continental U.S. of A. So take a kid fishing, please. If you aren't sure where to start, there's lots of uh, organizations, youth organizations, clubs, things like that that'll get you in the right direction. There's youth camps that usually include not only camping, canoeing, kayaking, but they also do fishing. So get them involved in that. And yes, as I mentioned last week, I wrote this book. It's called Take a Kid Fishing, an angler's guide, an adult's guide, I'm sorry, for introducing youngsters to the world of angling. The book is sale price for summer right now on my website, catchoutdoors.com, and copies are signed and include shipping. So that, that will, at least that'll steer you in the right direction if you're going to take this under your own wing, which I hope you do. I hope you take the kids and, and uh, get them out there fishing. Before I sign off, Thanks much for the notes, the great questions via email and text. Keep them coming. My email again is catchyoutdoors at gmail.com. Thank you so much for taking the time to tune in. My podcasts are scheduled for each and every Tuesday. If you enjoyed listening, please tell a friend, leave a review, and don't forget to subscribe to the channel. Catch Outdoors is presented by the Waypoint Podcast Network. It's available on Waypoint and many of your favorite podcast providers. The Facebook page is Catch Outdoors. The websites are catchoutdoors.com and waypointtv.com. Until next time, get outdoors and enjoy. Enjoy.